Rachel Blevins is probably my favorite American journalist and political commentator and a very popular guest here on the Mother of All Talk Shows and she is with us, I'm glad to say, again tonight. Uh, Rachel, uh, your country is no longer pretending uh, to uh, be a bystander or an observer in all of this. Both Biden and Harris rushed out their support for what Israel is doing in Lebanon. They're doing it with American airplanes. They're doing it with American bombs. They're doing it on American money. So it's actually America that's at war with Lebanon, not just Israel. Am I right? Oh, absolutely. And thank you for having me again. When you watch the statements that are put out, I mean, there's no condemnation. And again, there hasn't been any condemnation for weeks now, as we've seen Israel carry out terror attacks involving exploding pagers to then this last week. I mean, they killed over 700 people in Lebanon in just a matter of days. The overwhelming majority of them were civilians. And then we get to Friday's attack. And, you know, you get these initial reports out talking about Israel flattening entire apartment buildings in southern Beirut. And the question becomes, okay, how are they doing this, right? What bombs are they using? And then it comes out that they're using these special 2,000 pound bombs referred to as bunker buster bombs because essentially they hit the ground and then they detonate. They were specifically looking for the underground tunnels or bunkers that they believed that Syed Hassan Nasrallah was in. At this point, they got it right. A lot of questions about how that came to be and what intelligence was involved. But those bombs are specifically made in the U.S. and they were actually included in a shipment that the Biden administration sent over in December of last year. So in the aftermath of the October 7th attacks, we saw the U.S. really ramp up the arsenal that it was sending to Israel. That included these 2,000-pound bombs, which are illegal under the Geneva Convention. So the U.S. is violating international law just to send these bombs to Israel. Israel is violating international law you, using them. And you look around at the international community and the sheer lack of condemnation combined with, as you noted there, these statements that we got from Biden, from Harris, from John Kirby, all coming out and saying, oh, we support Israel, right? John Kirby claimed that the assassination of Nasrallah, that that was good for the world and good for the region. And it's like these people, they have the ability, the privilege, I would say, to just sit back here in the U.S. and to watch as the Middle East goes up in flames because they're profiting off of all of it. But I, I think the question now becomes where we go from here if Israel actually does try to pursue a ground invasion, because exactly as you were noting there in your intro, every single time that the resistance is knocked down, it comes back stronger. And that may not happen immediately. It may not happen as quickly as people want it to. But history has shown that the resistance cannot be defeated. And I think that that's something that all of the neocons and hawks in Washington, they really need to start paying attention to history because as it stands right now with the conflict and the war crimes that Israel has carried out and ignited in this region, it is not going to be good for them in the long run. Well, you can cut down the flowers, but you can't stop spring, of course. And uh, people who are resisting a foreign invader, a foreign occupier, are never going to give up their resistance. And eventually, uh, they will prevail, especially when the occupier, the invader, is only able to occupy, able to uh, invade, uh, because other countries give them all the means of doing so, and free gratis at that. Uh, eventually, there must come a time when the United States gets a politician who comes along and says, put America first, make America great again. <laughs> we are in a situation where your bridges and your dams are crumbling and being destroyed. Your trains are going off the tracks uh, your roads are filled with holes while you're giving billions to Benjamin Netanyahu. It doesn't make any sense. Can't last forever, that. 
It does not make any sense. I'm with you. I mean, this week alone, we're dealing with a hurricane. There's massive destruction on the East Coast, specifically in North Carolina. It's being hit really hard. And yet, what is the Biden administration doing? Oh, they're announcing another $8.7 billion in military aid for Israel. They're announcing another $8 billion in military aid for Ukraine. And it's like you look at the top of the political ticket, right? We know Joe Biden. We know that he has bragged that he is a Zionist, that he's proud of it for Israel. We know that he's not going to stop fighting a proxy war against Russia and Ukraine. But then the question becomes, okay, we also know that Biden's not going to be in office come January of 2025. So who is going to replace him? Well, on one hand, we have Kamala Harris, who basically is exactly like Biden. She is the exact establishment creature. She's made it clear she's going to stand with Israel, provide more bombs, stand with Ukraine, send even more bombs, no matter what it means for the U.S. And then we look at Donald Trump. And as you noted there, look, Trump has figured out the American people want a populist candidate. We want an anti-establishment candidate. And so he's run on this platform of uh, America first. And that's something that a lot of Americans say, yes, Finally, we want that. And then along the way, he runs into Israel. And if we've learned anything about Trump's first administration, his first four years in office, not only was he pro-Israel, but he let his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, basically run his Middle East policy. He said, yeah, I don't care if we illegally recognize the occupied Golan Heights or if we move the U.S. embassy to West Jerusalem. I, I don't care what the U.S. does there as long as we continue on with the support of Israel. And so when I look at where the U.S. is headed, it's extremely concerning to me to see these top two candidates who wouldn't do anything different than what the current U.S. administration under Biden, or I guess really Antony Blinken and Lloyd Austin and all of the rest of them, is actually doing to see the fact that even with just Trump's statements that he's putting out right now, he's not condemning Israel. He's just saying, oh, the war in Lebanon needs to stop, right? He's just saying, oh, the wars need to stop. It's all fine and good to say that, to say that you want to see an end to people dying. But if you don't have a fundamental understanding and if you can't communicate that to the people as to how we got to this point, and in this case, who the aggressor is, who is also on top of that sending those bombs that are being used on heavily populated civilian areas, then what Trump is really telling the world is that he would do no different if he was in office. It doesn't matter if he gets a few more people in his cabinet who are you know, calling out the hypocrisy of the war in Ukraine and U.S. support for it. What matters is that his foreign policy would not fundamentally change when it comes to Israel. And that seems to be the key here of why Trump is allowed to get into office in the first place is because the U.S. establishment at its core knows that nothing will fundamentally change. And I think that that's something that a lot more Americans need to be paying attention to here. Now, you know American politics better than me, of course, but my reading of, say, the state of Michigan uh, is that uh, Kamala Harris's candidature is now dead in the water in the state of Michigan, or dead in the blood of thousands of Lebanese people with her support, with her administration's weapons, her administration's aircraft, her administration's money. When she signed that statement supporting Israel's war in Lebanon, she could kiss the state of Michigan goodbye, and maybe others. What do you think? Oh, I'm with you on that one. I, it's interesting to see kind of how this has come about in the U.S. because during the Democratic primaries, we had this creation of the uncommitted movement, right? A group of people came out and they said, look, Joe Biden at the time, who was the mm. only nominee that the Democratic Party wanted, they said, you know what? We can't vote for him. He's allowing a genocide to be carried out by Israel, enabled by the U.S., and really carried out by the U.S. as well. Therefore, we are just going to put uncommitted on our ballots. We're not going to vote for anyone. We're going to stick it to the Democratic Party. Well, 
as they did that, that seemed all fine and good at the time, up until in recent weeks you had the uncommitted movement come out and they said, well, we clearly can't endorse Harris because she's no different than Biden, right? She may speak a little bit differently and claim that she cares about the Palestinians, but the heart of her policies, they're no different. We can't endorse Donald Trump because he's also no different. But then they put in there a little clause in their statement saying, well, we also aren't really encouraging you to vote third party. We're actually encouraging you to do everything you can to stop Donald Trump because we believe that he would be worse. So in a way, they're endorsing Harris, but not really endorsing her. And it just reminds me of the place that American people are in looking at this upcoming contest and still claiming that they have to choose the lesser of two evils when the results are still evil. So I I think when it comes down to a state like Michigan, what you're ultimately going to see is very low voter turnout. You may see increased turnout for third party candidates. We do have Jill Stein for the Green Party and we do have Chase Oliver for the Libertarian Party who are calling this what it is, a genocide carried out by Israel along with the U.S. They are making that statement very clearly. So I do think that you could see increased support for them. But I also think that at the end of the day, you're going to see a lot of Americans just stay home because they look at the top of the ticket. They ask the question of what is actually going to change at the end of the day if they genuinely care about U.S. foreign policy. And the answer when it comes to Israel, when it comes to Lebanon, when it comes to Palestine, the answer is nothing is expected to act actually change. Rachel Blevins, as always, thanks very much for joining us on the mother of all talk shows.